The mind isn't complicated at all once you understand it. People often believe that if you have a complex illness like depression or anorexia, then the treatment must be complex too, and that's also not true. You can actually fix really complex matters quite fast if you understand those three workings of the mind and put them into practice. Welcome to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. This is Jeff Lerner, your host. Always thrilled to be with you for yet another wonderful conversation with a wonderful human being. Today, I am joined by Marissa Peer, who doesn't probably need a ton of introduction, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fumble through a bit of it anyway. Um, she's the creator of Rapid Transformational Therapy, the founder of IamEnough.com. She's just widely known across the internet and the world um, as an author, motivational speaker, expert on personal development. Um, she does a lot of celebrity therapy. She probably knows all kinds of juicy things that we'd love to know, but she can't talk about. Um, and she's actually trained over 5,000 uh, rapid transformational therapists around the world. She's a luminary figure in you know, psychology and personal development. And we are thrilled to have her on Millionaire Secrets. Marissa, welcome to the show. Well, I'm thrilled to be here too. And I'm so honored and flattered that you asked me. Thank you. Yes, of course. This is this is great. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan <laughs> of all the stuff that I see online and probably a good chunk of the audience is too. So what I'd like to do is start with the stuff that we don't see online. Um, maybe Maybe kind of roll it back You've had an incredible career. You've done so many things, but can you kind of take us back to the, the day, the moment, the environment when, when you realized, hey, I have an opportunity to do something different and perhaps really cool with my life, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zig instead of zag, and what drove that decision? Yeah, that's, there's so many moments. One of the key moments was I was always going to be a child psychologist, but I didn't finish that. It was, that's quite a tough career when you're very young because you always have three patients, like mum, dad, usually divorce and a child. And it can be quite hard to break through. It's very slow and I've always wanted fast results. So I left that and I ended up by a series of events working for Jane Fonda in her um, Jane Fonda's workout place in South Robertson Boulevard here in L.A., and that was a moment for me because I realized how many women coming to her classes were bulimic, anorexic, body dysmorphic, and exercise compulsive. I mean, every fourth, every third woman. And I realized something fascinating. Eating issues are emotional and you can't fix them with logic. And they were logically dieting, exercising, taking diet pills, none of which works. And that got me looking at studying what lies behind all these eating problems and it, it was definitely an emotion it, in fact it turned out to be the i'm not enough emotion but it took me a bit longer to put that together and then i eventually formed my i'm enough movement so i started out just wanting to help people who had eating problems body dysmorphia and that was so successful that it led me to do everything else and then i think the second time i had that thought was when i was told i could never have children that i was infertile and even if I could get pregnant I could never carry a baby to full term and I had this voice in my head even there going don't don't let that in that's just not for you to let in and I decided not to let it in and I got pregnant very easily had a perfect baby and and realized how important it is to not give your power away to other people who often have the best intentions but really don't know what they're telling you that's powerful so I mean, I want to, I just kind of want to pause on that. So you were told if you get pregnant, the baby will not live. Well, I was told I would probably never get pregnant. And even if I did, I would not have a normal baby. And actually, when I did get pregnant, I was told several times during that pregnancy, you know, there's something wrong with the baby. It's not growing. And my baby was born weighing almost eight pounds. So that certainly wasn't true. Yeah. I mean, what a, what a act of belief. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's very important. I tell people this a lot. Look, whatever's going on in your life, you cannot give your power away to a doctor. And a doctor says, hey, you've got cancer. You've got 
this, you've got that, you'll never get better. They mean well, of course, but we meet people every day go, yeah, I didn't turn into that diagnosis. And it's very important to think, okay, am I really prepared to give all my power up? Can I do something? Can I fix this? And we know so many of the people that we worship and look up to are being told, this can't happen, you can't do that, you'll never be healthy, normal, well, successful. And yet they all, they are because it's what you say to yourself that matters. The most important words you'll ever hear are the words you say to yourself on a regular basis. And often we say to ourselves on a regular basis, I'm never going to make it. Who's going to love me? And you've got to flip those around and, and tell yourself something positive because it will probably work. Yeah, I was a high school dropout who wasn't supposed to amount to much. So yeah. Some of the best people are, some of the best people I've ever met have been uh, left school, had no qualifications, dragged up by parents who treat them terribly, and yet they've turned out to be remarkable human beings. I mean, look at Oprah Winfrey, look at Tony Robbins, there's so many people out there. You know, Danny DeVito was told, well, you'll never be a movie star. So was Whoopi Goldberg. So actually, amazingly, was, oh, gosh, her name's escaped. We'll come back to me in a minute. Mer Meryl Streep. And yet, if you have that, I'll show you attitude. It really helps. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to imagine watching Meryl Streep in an audition and saying, oh, you'll never amount to anything. Like, she's well, she went, amazing. she went to audition for King Kong for the part that Jessica Lange got. And apparently, I, I mustn't, I don't know this word for word, but the director said, Meryl, you're not beautiful enough to play the part. Go away and do something else. And her reply was, words to the effect of, that's your opinion in a sea of opinions. And I think I'll go and find another opinion. So she wasn't told she couldn't act. She was told she wasn't pretty enough to act. But have you ever seen one of my favorite films out of Africa where Robert Redford washes her hair in the bath? She looks so beautiful in that. And, you know, beauty is it, it's up to you to decide if you're beautiful or not. Yeah, that's interesting. I, and I do I actually really love that movie. That was like one of my parents' yeah. favorite movies growing up. And I, I was exposed film. to it really young. Um, so, OK, so so you you got this job, I guess, at the Jane Fonda <laughs> You know, I don't, workout what was it, a, a clinic? Fonda, or a, it was called Jane Fonda Workout Studios. Okay, so it was a physical location that people yeah. would come to. Yeah, it was a proper workout studio. In the aerobic boom of the late 80s, right. she, it was the place to be. Yeah, I remember her uh, seeing her tapes when I was a kid on the shelves hmm. at, at Blockbuster. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, okay, so, well, first of all, you don't, clearly you're not originally from Los Angeles. I don't want to make assumptions, but your, your yeah, accent. I'm from, I'm from the UK. Yeah, it gives that away. There. So how'd you get to California? Uh, I just came out here. My boyfriend at the time was a footballer, came out to America. I just came out for a holiday, actually, and then decided to stay. And that was, that was in a time when it wasn't really hard to get a work permit. It was, it was a whole different world. It was late 80s. So I came out here. I already was teaching aerobics in the UK, but teaching it for her was a whole different ball game. And yeah, so I came here, loved it. And then eventually I went back to the UK because um, I didn't have the, the work visa that I have now. But now we live here half the year and we absolutely love it. So you, you have these women coming in and was it all women? at the Jane Fonda place? No, a lot of guys, a lot of guys. But um, it was fascinating there was that somebody would come in who'd be the head of, say, Fox or CNN, and they go, oh, you know, God, I ate some chocolate or I, I drank a milky coffee and I feel so bad about myself. And all of the people there, most of the men that were there too, they judged themselves on what they looked like, what they weighed, how, how good their abs were. And it was a fascinating time of my life because I lived in West Hollywood, and I had two roommates, one was bulimic, one was anorexic. And that was a real lesson to me in this, the, the, the words they tell themselves. And they were both very unhappy. And I really wanted to find a way to help them and to help everybody. Because of course, when you, lit, when you work in an exercise studio, you'd call it a gym now, but they didn't call them gyms then. You get really consumed with your worth is what you look like. What do you look like in a leotard? How flat is your stomach? How toned are your thighs? And it's such a fake world. It's a very dangerous world. 
where your worth is what you look like. But now in the in 2021, it's a million times worse because now you have the internet and magazines and, and people going on Instagram and Facebook. And every day we get what I call it, you get overexposed to fake images of perfection that tell you you're not enough. You don't look like that. And it, it's so hard for people who watch something like Keeping Up With The Kardashians to think that's real. You know, I used to watch, my daughter used to watch Friends. I'm like, darling, no waitress lives in Central Park. That's just not possible. But a lot of these shows and magazines lie to people. They give them the lie, you know, look perfect and you'll be happy. There's so many perfect people are unhappy because first of all, it's very hard to look perfect. Maybe you can pull that off for a while, but you're always in a taxi with a meter running. And we should be saying to people, hey, you know, do something that makes your heart sing. Feel good about who you are. It's not about the size of your waist or thighs or stomach or what you weigh or how old you are or the, the label of your clothes. We've been, become consumed by being a number. And it's, it's such a shame. We're making a whole generation really, really unwell with this these perfect images that we see on the, on the screen all the time that, that are completely fake. So essentially people aren't even comparing themselves to other people. They're comparing themselves to false illusions of other people. Yeah. So, that, so it's unattainable. Well, it's not unattainable. Imagine you've just had a baby and you look at some supermodel who's got a baby and she's on the catwalk a week after giving birth looking amazing and you think oh what's wrong with me but you know they've got a whole army of staff it's very different so whenever you compare people we see that in schools you know in schools what i really don't like about schools is they always reward achievement not effort so the naturally smart kid that does no work right. gets all the prizes and the kid that's working really hard but not getting the same marks doesn't get rewarded and our whole education system, oh, so much of our systems are really incorrect and we, we really need to change that because all of these things damage people's self-esteem, chip away at people. You know, I live in LA and I'm amazed at how many homeless young people there are here. And you can see they've really lost hope and have lost their way because usually nobody believed in them and, and 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 it's hard to be believed in when all you judge is the grades you get not the work you put into getting any grade so i i totally agree with everything you're saying and i've experienced some of what you're saying and even though most people think i'm in pretty good shape for my age i i obsess over the fact that i in my entire 41 years i've never seen my bottom two abs and it makes me crazy like i totally get it um but uh, so, so yeah, I mean, how do you, how do you intervene? I mean, it seems like it's you versus this massive construct that is the world and it's skewed, you know, pathological mindset and here, you know, you've developed a, a technique, like, how does it work? How is it even remotely effective with such a big adversary? Well, first of all, I created something called the I'm Enough movement. And it's really just about telling yourself that you're enough, writing it on your mirror. I have these little bracelets that say I'm enough and we give them away all the time. And it's really getting people to understand the way you feel about anything at all is down to two things, the pictures you make in your head and the words you say to yourself. And when you start to change the words and the pictures, it changes your life. So most people wake up and their first thought is, I'm not enough. I don't look enough. I don't earn enough. I'm not interesting enough. I'm not smart enough. And so when I get people to just say, I am enough, because no baby is born ever with a belief, well, well I'm not enough. All babies know they're enough. It's why they demand attention, because they have this innate belief, I'm worth it. It's very easy to start chipping away at that. But the truth is, for everyone on the planet, we were born knowing or at least believing we were enough. So all you're doing is reactivating something that you were born with, re-manifesting something you came onto the planet with. And so just beginning to say that, put it on your screen, say to put it on your ringtone, write it all over your house, make sure you say it. I have it in all my passwords, but obviously very securely, but I have to type that out many times a day to unlock my phone, my computer. And so I'm always becoming a living, walking, talking example. What you say, you tend to believe. 
So the I'm enough movement seems so simple, but its strength is in its simplicity. And many schools now write to me and say, wow, you know, we've been using this. And bullying has almost disappeared in our school. The kids are so much better. They, they're doing better without having that competitive edge. And many companies write to me and say, hey, you know, all our young staff, we all use the I'm enough. And it's made such a difference. And so that has really got a momentum all of its own. So I'm enough is something I'm very proud of and we're, we're aiming to make it bigger. We're gonna have an I'm enough day starting again next year. So that's exciting. And then of course we have our TT, which is, I've actually trained 7,000 therapists now, but um, we have people all over the world giving people a better effective therapy that isn't about let's come in every week and talk about your feelings it's about let's find out what's gone on with you and fix you because therapy is a strange model it's a model that says turn up every week with your pain and we'll have a conversation about it well no other um, model has that no doctor says let's talk about your pain no dentist says let's have a long discussion about your pain you know I, I had a time when I was in New York and out of the blue, I went into anaphylactic shock, which has never happened before. And it was quite scary. And I got in an ambulance. So I didn't go, hey, I need to build up a relationship with a doctor. I need to discuss it. I'm like, just keep me alive. My, my lips are swelling up. I can hardly breathe. I figured I had four minutes. And during that time, I was hypnotizing myself all the time and telling my body to fix itself and to, to be OK. And I, it started to work, actually, luckily, even before I got to see a doctor. But, you know, in pain, you don't need a relationship. You need someone to say, let me make you better. And I've always thought therapy should be the same model. Turn up with your pain and I'll fix it. You've got chronic headaches. You've got chronic self-esteem. You've got a fear or a phobia. That should be fixed as effectively as a broken leg or a broken tooth. You should be fixing it there and then on the spot, not having a drawn out conversation about it for weeks and weeks and weeks. So, you know, I... I that sounds, you know, amazing and, and certainly logical. I, I imagine that the reason that's not just sort of the obvious way that things have unfolded is because the mind is this mushy, inscrutable thing that nobody knows exactly where to, you know, place the stitch and the glue. So, so how, how do you go in and fix it like that? I mean, yeah, that, that kind of sounds too good, right? That's a really good question. You know, I've been a therapist for 33 years. and I was taught that when I was training, I was told what everyone is told. The mind is very complex indeed. It takes a lifetime to understand the workings of the human mind. It takes another lifetime to put it into practice. And I'm thinking then that, that can't be. Since we haven't got two lifetimes, how could it be that it takes a lifetime to understand your mind and a love and lifetime to put that into practice? And you know, like all people who are in the healing field, it's your own clients that teach you everything. And I began to learn from my own clients very quickly that actually the mind is not complicated at all. In fact, you only have to understand a very few things about your mind to totally get it. And one is your mind does what it thinks you want. Everything you're doing, even something you hate, say you bite your nails or pull out your eyelashes or pick at your skin, your mind believes that your, it, you, your mind's job is to do what it thinks you want. And it listens to what you say. When you say things like, my job's killing me, that relationship's gonna kill me, this kid is making me crazy, you're telling your mind what you don't want. If I had money, I'd never know who my friends are. Once you have money, people use you. So you're actually saying to mind, I don't want any money. So the first thing to understand is that your mind listens to what you say. And if you haven't got what you want, your mind thinks you don't want it. And if you've got a lot of what you don't want, like procrastination and sabotage, your mind thinks, well, you do want it. Second thing to understand about your mind, it's vexing until you understand it, is that we are hardwired to always return to what's familiar and always avoid what is unfamiliar. So if you've never had praise, you'll actually feel very uncomfortable with praise, but guess what? Really comfortable with criticism. If you've never had love, you'll reject it. 70% of lottery winners are dead broke in three years because if you've never had money and you win a lot of money, as hard as it is to understand, you will reject that too. And the third thing about the mind 
Um, and all of these things are very simple, is that the way you feel about everything is down to something very simple, the pictures you construct and the words you say to yourself, which you are free to change. So if we understand those three things about the mind, familiar, unfamiliar response to words and pictures does what it thinks you want it to do, what it thinks is in your own best interest. Now we can think, okay, but then I can change the words and pictures. If criticism is familiar and praise is unfamiliar, I have the power to reverse that and make praise super familiar. And if my mind does what it thinks I want, well, if I sit down and really tell it what I want using positive, relevant, up-to-date language, then I get what I want. And that's absolutely correct. So the mind isn't complicated at all once you understand it and of course people often believe that if you have a complex illness like depression or anorexia then the treatment must be complex too and that's also not true you can actually fix really complex matters quite fast if you understand those three workings of the mind and put them into practice so this is this is amazing by the way um I mean, this is the this is the the meat that I I want and that I love. This is I you know my my vision here is that my whole audience they can listen to this, and those that want support they will find you or they will find one of your RTT certified therapists and they will hire you and and the the rewards will flow up to you and that's amazing. But there might be someone out there who can't afford any of that, who doesn't sure. even think of themselves that way, and I want them to benefit too. So. Um, I I want to retouch on this and then I kind of want to try to contextualize it with a an example. So again, the three things were um, what it, the mind tells, the mind pursues what it thinks you want. Yeah. And I'm literally, I'm taking notes. So if you hear typing, Good. that's what's happening. So the mind pursues what it thinks you want. Um, it, it pursues what it's already familiar with. Yeah. And then exactly. it pursues the images and the words. Yeah. That it holds in its, you know, conscious, yeah. or, you know, exactly. subconscious database or whatever. Okay. So, so let's take someone like me. C okay. Can we use me as a guinea pig? Please, of course. Okay. So, um, you know, I'll, quick, like 30 second scenario. I am scaling a company right now. Um, we're, we're at a place where in terms of the size of the company, it's growing to a place where my level of visibility and prominence is getting to a place that is, is frankly uncomfortable unless I keep doing the work to, to, to acclimate to it, right? A lot of people, like I got recognized in an airport coming off an escalator four days ago. And it's like, that stuff's starting to happen. It's like, whoa, mm -hmm. this is weird. And then familiarity, I grew up with successful parents. Money was around, we took vacations. We were at a certain standard. I'm just now starting, sort of hitting that threshold where I'm passing that standard. So mm -hmm. I'm starting to reach a level of, of abundance that's unfamiliar. And again, I keep, I keep finding ways that my, my instinct is to regress to the mean and I have to keep pushing, right? And then words and pictures, uh, that's, that's probably a whole other conversation. So like, could you maybe step me through a quick exercise of like how to tweak on these three yeah. points sure. to, so that I have no limitations? Absolutely. So first of all, I want you to decide that you are an Olympic athlete of your chosen career. So say you're in IT, you have to go, look, I am an Olympian. What does an Olympian, an Olympian gets up every day and trains. They don't go, oh God, I hate this. It's cold. They go, I'm getting a gold medal. Right. They, they don't wish or hope. They go, I am getting a, a gold medal. So an Olympian is very focused on that, where they're going. They understand that your potential expands as you move towards, you have no idea what your potential is because as you get to it, it will expand and expand again. So in a, in a business situation, you have to decide, I'm gonna have an Olympic menta mentality. I'm going to do whatever it takes. But while you're doing whatever it takes, you have to say, I love it. An Olympic doesn't go, go, let me train. You go, I hate it, hate it, hate it. It's so boring, it hurts. They, you have to decide, I love it. So when you're building a business, getting up early, going to bed late, building a career, working on your own, you have to understand that every word you say and every thought you think is a blueprint that your mind is moving towards. And there's a couple of things that will absolutely change your mind, change your life. And one of them is to go, oh, I want this. I want it. I love it. 
I'll do whatever it takes. So rather than like an Olympic training in the dark, training in the cold, you have to go, I want this. I want it, want it, want it. I've chosen it, chosen it, chosen it. And I've chosen to feel great about it. That sentence, I have chosen this yeah. and chosen to feel great about it, says to your mind, oh, you want it. When you go, oh, I want to work out, but my legs hurt. I want money, but I don't want to put in the hours. I want success, but I want to go to the bar with my friend. You're saying, well, I don't want it enough. So when you say I've chosen it and chosen to love every minute of it, there's no room now for saying, I think I'll have a beer. Why don't I lie on the sofa and eat lots of candy? I think I'm going to sabotage myself or procrastinate because you've said I've chosen it and chosen to be. Imagine if you chose to be a vegan and said every day, oh God, I miss bacon. It's killing me to live without sausage. I die for a steak now you're never going to be a very successful vegan a vegan says i have chosen to never again eat a creature and i just do whatever it takes and if i'm in a place where there's no food there's no food that isn't me i'll go without because i've chosen it you see the words i've chosen it and just go to what they actually say is this is who i am a vegan says this is who i am a bodybuilder because this is who i am a, a pacifist uh, an, an Olympic, okay, this is who I am. It's not, mm, I'm going to try, it's hard, it's who I am. So for you, you got to say, this is who I am. Building this business is who I am. I love it. I've chosen it. I've chosen to feel great about anything I need to do to make it work. I want this so much. You see, if you hate needles and you're in pain, suddenly you want a needle so badly because... It's how you feel about anything. The, the second thing is to really say, is to decide to link, to link pleasure to it and to start saying, I'm making this familiar. You see, imagine you're, you, you've got lenses. Now you're asked to do something very peculiar. You're asked to put a bit of plastic on your finger and ram it in your eye. That is so unfamiliar. But if you do it every day, it becomes familiar. First time you get that lens in your eye, your eye will water and try desperately to get it out. But if you keep doing it, what was unfamiliar is familiar until you can pop in a lens without a mirror. You can actually squeeze your eyeball and get that lens out without a mirror because you can make anything familiar over time. So after you've started to say, I want this, I've chosen it, I've chosen to feel great, but you need to say the next thing, I am making this familiar. Never add if it kills me, that's really bad. Right. I'm making it familiar. I see so many people with money blocks who say, you know, I want money and then they get rid of it and parents who try to solve their kids' money problems with more money. So what you have to say is, I'm making wealth familiar. I'm making a bunch of, I'm making love familiar. Here's something fascinating. If you've never had love or if you've had conditional love, where people threaten to reject you, leave you if you don't shape up, you now begin to believe that love actually is, makes you vulnerable. And so a lot of people actually, what they make familiar is attracting the wrong person. So imagine you've had a pattern of going out with the wrong person who's never been right for you. And you've always had to work for love and chase love and earn love. All you have to say is I'm making being loved by the right person, loving them back so familiar. I'm making it familiar. I'm making love work familiar and if you say that over and over again remember that is the blueprint so if we were, if we were all taught from the minute we started school or by our parents every thought you think is a blueprint every word you say is a blueprint that your mind and body and psyche must work to make real in fact the strongest force in every one of us is that we must act in a way that is consistent with how we define ourselves. When you go, this is who I am. I'm loving this. I'm choosing this. I am making this familiar. You know, I, I had to do that. I came from a family where my father was my head teacher. He wasn't really interested in me very much at all because he was so interested in other people's children being a principal. And of course, with that kind of background, I tr was attracted to men that weren't that interested in me until one day I decided, you know what, I I'm not going to do this anymore. And so I kept saying, I'm going to make the 
greatest love, so familiar. And in no time at all, I found someone who put me first above everything. I was married to him within 10 months. We're blissfully happy because I should have really done that 20 years earlier, but then I wouldn't have met him. But it's a choice. You say I'm making it familiar. I'm making getting up early, going to bed late. I'm making juice. I'm making buying the right food, opening my fridge and, and having something healthy there familiar. I'm making taking sugar out of my coffee familiar. Of course, it doesn't taste familiar for the first few weeks and then you get totally used to it. I'm making going to the gym. I'm making being a phenomenally successful business person familiar. I'm working on my website, on my business plan. I'm working on crowdfunding and attracting business partners and if you keep saying it and saying it and saying it that is the blueprint so you have to say I'm making it familiar and then people get a little confused about the pictures and words in my head and I'm not visual you can actually forget about the pictures altogether and just focus on the words if you say I am a phenomenally successful businessman I am an incredible salesperson I have such a gift for selling my product. If you say that over and over again, you make a picture anyway, because your mind is always making a picture. And when you say it, you move towards it, but you have to keep your mind on what you want and off what you don't want by only focusing on the right words. And it, it helps to understand that the mind only works in the present tense. You can never say things like next year, I'll be a millionaire. Next year, I'm gonna have a beach body. Next year, I'm gonna have love the mind only works in the right now so it has to be now even though that isn't true i am becoming super successful now the words have to be very exciting you can't go yeah every day and everywhere my life is better and better because that doesn't even make a picture it must make a picture clients love me i i'm a just a natural seller i'm a phenomenal speaker i'm an incredible author my product is just setting the world on fire and so the more exciting, the more you can turn on your mind with vivid, clear, relevant pictures that make sense, the more likely you are to go out there and get it. Hey, sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to let you know you can get a free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut, which will show you the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy. And there's a special link just for this episode in the description. So thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. Is that was beautifully articulated I'm, and as you're talking i'm a i'm taking notes and i'm also processing it through you know my own filter of my own life right yeah. so so the notes that i took and, and and again my intent here is to kind of create a little a little model that anybody listening can go yeah. they, they can do the same exercise right so you started with i'm an olympian mm -hmm. um, and 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 it was a it was a very declamatory i am Hmm. a very specific label, right? Yeah. Um, so for me, you know, my company, Entra, we're taking on big education and we're trying to disrupt the, the college learning model because yeah. there's better ways to learn and better things to learn that produce better outcomes for people. So like, I am a, an Olympian level educational disruptor. Yeah, or, I love that. And take out the word trying because the minute you say trying, okay. trying is a mis it implies failure. You say, I am. Yes, it's like Yoda, Yoda said that, right? That yeah. Do or yeah. do not, there is do, no Yeah, try. but don't try. I would say trying is very trying. <laughs> but you've already got a very good statement of truth that you just came up with. And, and that's good. You should have a statement that's really concise, descriptive, not too long and powerful that you can state to yourself every day, all the time. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I've been, I've been you know, I started Entre two and a half years ago. And I have been obsessing. I, this is such a, a timely conversation for me. And, and for anybody listening who's got a thing and they want to get it out to market, I mean, I can tell you that I have, I have seen more and more progress in my mission the more and more I've gotten clear on my language. Yeah. Um, and, and even this morning, I literally changed in the description on my Instagram pro gram profile. I added the words disrupting big Good. education. Good. And you know, you're so correct because when you're clear on it, it helps other people to be clear. Mm -hmm. And you're, you know, 80% of success is mindset, which people find really baffling. 80%. But that's true. 80% of your success is your mindset. If you get your mindset right first, you got a clear blueprint to go towards. And 
the only reason I use an Olympian as an example is they have a mindset of winning. They don't go, it's too cold to train. I think I'll have a day off. They understand that coming third or fourth, no one remembers who gets the bronze. You got to win. And so, you know, the Vikings used to have this really interesting belief that the only way home is straight through our enemies. They turn up, they burn their boats, that you won or died. And because they had no way home except winning, they were terrifying. You know, fighting people have got nothing to lose. And often when I've worked with boxers or all kinds of athletes, football players, soccer players, they again have that winning mentality. I worked with a football team many years ago that weren't doing very well. And we painted their faces blue and they put on the helmets with the horns in and they decided they were the Vikings on the pitch. And that belief, we are Vikings. We win at all costs was really good for them because it gave them an image to move towards. We're always moving towards an image. And often we don't understand the image we move towards is the wrong image. I'm moving towards an image of being in love, but I'm terrified of being dumped. I'm terrified that they'll be disappointed. I'm moving towards an image of wealth, but my parents said rich people sell their soul to the devil. I want never gets. Don't be greedy. Who's looking at you? And so we have this image that we're trying to go towards. And your mind is really like a laser moving towards the image when it's clear. But if the image is, I want love, but I don't want to be rejected. I want success, but I don't want to work seven days a week. And how will I be a great parent if I'm working towards success? Now your mind's not a laser. It's a closed right. It's going backwards, forwards, forwards, backwards. So you have to be clear. I can imagine if you wanted to have a tattoo all sleeves all over your arms, you have a choice. I'm going to imagine how cool that is. I'm going to look really cool. But if you go, but it's going to hurt. I'm going to have a needle in my skin. Oh, that's going to be super painful. I don't like needles. You will never succeed in having a tattoo if you link pain to the tattooing. You have to link pleasure to it. And that's what's so amazing is that you can choose. People who have a tattoo choose to love having a needle shoved in their back. I wouldn't love that. I wouldn't have a tattoo. But some people, like junkies, they link huge pleasure to shoving a needle in all weird parts of their body. I mean, I've worked with clients who've injected themselves in the scrotum and the labia because they, they, they're often quite famous. They don't want people to see the track marks. And you think, what kind of brain is that? Well, you can link pleasure. I worked with models who eat toilet tissue on a shoot because they don't want to eat food. So they literally eat toilet paper, cotton ball soaked in orange juice to fill up their stomach. And imagine trying to eat toilet tissue and cotton ball soaked in orange juice. But you know how you do it? You link pleasure to it. You go, if I do this, I'll be super thin and skinny and really hot on that shoot. And that's not a good image. But what I'm trying to get you to see is not trying getting you to see is that you can do anything if you link pleasure to it. Mm. And if you want to be a millionaire, want success, you've got to link pleasure to working hard, to believing in yourself. And many people do something like this. You can go, hey, I can just manifest. I'm going to lie in this over going, I'm a billionaire, I'm a billionaire, I'm a billionaire. There's three parts to success. The first part is really focus on what you want and decide you want it. The second part is you must decide you're worth it or you'll get rid of it all. And many people do that. They earn a lot and they get rid of it all because they don't ever believe they're worth it or they worked hard enough. And the third part is you must decide to work hard. Many people have kind of lost that. Oh, I don't have to work. I just, I'm a manifesto. It's all going to come to me. I, I know someone out in LA has got a very good idea. But they said, they said yeah, but we, I don't want to work. I mean, they've had this idea for 20 years. I'm like, you have to work. No, that's not my ethos. My ethos is if it's meant to be, it will work. And if it isn't meant to be, it won't work. I'm like, no, that's like saying, if I'm meant to have a six pack, I'll wake up with one. If I'm meant to have a six pack, I better go to the gym, work out hard, eat a better diet, then I can have a six pack. But I can't really have a six pack if I eat donuts all day, lie on the couch and I'm just manifesting a six. Some people think you can, you can really manifest that. But I think you have to have all three, the belief that, that you have to want it so much then you have to believe you're worth it. And then you have to decide, what will I do? You know, for instance, you know, I write books. The first time I got a book advance, I actually gave it back because I couldn't even comprehend how at 25 I could shut myself away and write in longhand. It seemed so boring and so isolating. 
because when I got my second book advance, I'd learned a lot that I had to go, I love writing. There's nowhere I'd rather be in the whole world than sitting in my house writing a book, which wasn't true. But when I said it enough, amazingly, it became true. And suddenly there was nowhere I would rather be than writing this book. But then I had to decide, okay, so I've written a book. Publisher loves the book, but what am I going to do now? Because if you want to be a published author today, you better be a speaker too, because most publishing houses are not going to give you money unless you can go on stage and do a TED talk and sell your book. So the next thing is, what can I learn then to make me even better in business? Um, you know, I'm a therapist, but I've learned all about search engine optimization. I was writing a book years ago called Get Pregnant Now. And then I realized that what people search for is the title trying to get pregnant. I don't even like the word trying. I think it's a terrible word, but it's the most searched for word. I thought, well, I better call my book that then because that will come up first when people search. But that wasn't something natural to me. I'm a writer, I'm a therapist. I'm not, I don't understand enough about IT, but I understand enough to know, look, I don't want to be a writer. I want to be a best selling writer. That's the thing about the mind. Should I say I want to write a book? Okay, I've written a book. No one's bought it. No one's published it because that wasn't clear. I want to write a best-selling book that flies off the shelves that people love, that changes. Well, now my mind is clear. And then I go and I'll do whatever it takes, whatever it takes. And because I said that when my book came up, what it took was writing articles for magazines I would never read, writing boring articles. But that's how you sell a book. You have to be prepared to spend more time promoting that book than you ever spent writing it. I met John Gray and he said, you know, I spent hours promoting my books more than I ever spent writing them. But it's that image in your mind. I want it. I'm worth it. I'll do the work. In fact, I'll do whatever it takes. And I tell myself I love it too. If you can do that, you almost can't stop yourself being successful. So I, I'm going to share with you on the heels of what you just said, I'm going to share with you and with the audience something I've never actually talked about on the show, even though it's it's literally the impetus that started this show. Sure. Um, I'm, I decided, uh, in fact, I, I even took some initial feints in that direction. Uh, but I guess it's been a year, a little over a year to write a book. And it's exactly what you just said. It was like, I don't love the, exp I don't love the process of writing a book because frankly, I'm a lot more wired for immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. I'd rather go close a deal or something mm -hmm. and get a check, you know, but I was, I want to be a New York times bestselling author. It, it's just something yeah. I want to do. And I also think it's an important strategic move for the business that I'm trying to build yeah. and the mission that I'm trying to, to progress. That's actually why I started this show. I said, okay, I could take about, I think about two years and it'll take me, let's say a year to go from, you know, ideation to completion of writing the book and publishing the book and all that. But I'm going to go ahead and start another year in advance and I'm going to start a show and I'm going to start inviting celebrities, influencers, people with audiences onto the show, build relationships get to know people, build goodwill, ask for nothing in return. And two years from now, when my book is ready, I'll have a Rolodex of probably three, 400 people that I can go back around to and say, hey, I had a great time with you on the show. We've stayed in touch. Uh, would you be interested in, in reading a chapter of my book? And if you like it, would you be willing to promote it? And if I can have three or 400, let's say even a 10th of them, you know, 40 influencers out there willing to promote my book with me, now I don't need the publisher's money exactly. to go sell the book. But it's a two-year long game yeah. because I didn't just say I want to write a book. I said, I want to write a bestseller. Yeah. And it, that's, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, because you, what you're saying so cleverly is that you had a goal, but you broke it down. And, and also you didn't say, I'm going to try. You said, I am writing a book in two years. This is going to happen. You had a plan and you worked towards that plan because what you are moving towards is always moving towards you. And, and that was so clever that you made a particular goal with steps. Because I would say, yeah, my goal is to get married. My goal is to be rich. My goal is, well, what are you going to do? I don't know, but it's just my goal. And that's not a goal. That's a wish. That's a wish. That's a dream. That's a fantasy. But when you put in the steps, what I'm going to do and how it's going to work, 
it will work. And, and that's great that you shared that with the audience, what you did and how you did it. Because, and you're also correct because years ago you had to go to a publisher and you had to give them a book and they would look at it and you got 10%. And if they gave you a big enough advance, they'd spend money on the publicity too. But nowadays, many smart people self-publish because they get to keep all the money. Secondly, the book, you can bring out the book whenever you want to. And the days of having your book in the, in, I mean, I've had my book in the window of a bookstore. It's amazingly exciting, but actually nowadays getting your book to being number one on Amazon or the New York times is actually what it's really all about. And so, yeah, you've done that exactly correctly. And anyone can look at you and go, Hey, that's a recipe. See, if you were Jamie Oliver, you'd say, I'm Jamie Oliver, take some chicken, take some lemon, take some coconut, take some sage, do this, 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 and this in that order. What will come out of the oven is a dish almost like I cook. We'll say, yeah, well, I'm going to use a duck and not chicken. And I'm, I'm going to use orange juice and not coconut milk. And I'm going to do it differently. And now, oh, it didn't actually turn out that well. If you have a formula to follow, and it's the formula for success, then follow that formula. Your formula is great. And other people can follow exactly what you've done maybe in a different way, but it's when people think, yeah, but I'm going to do a shortcut. I, I, I'm, I'm going to miss out that bit. I don't want to do that step. I'll do the first bit. I'll do a few stomach crunches, but not leg lifts. I don't like those. I'll, I'll do half a sit up and then expect to get the same results. You have to really apply yourself. I think a lot of people have lost this understanding of working hard, but of course the, the trick is that when you love something, doesn't actually feel like hard work and I bet you started off not liking writing but then really got into it didn't you yeah and and to be honest uh I I it's been interesting with all these interviews you know I've recorded about I think this is episode number 120 maybe 125 and and I started it about nine months ago and I really didn't but you know when you first start a show it's not like you have five guests a week I mean you do one mm. and it might take you three weeks to have somebody else say yes, right? And so you slowly pick up speed. I've probably done a hundred of these in the last five or six months. Wow. So it's a, it's a rapid pace. Sure. And at times it feels exhausting. Yeah. At times it feels engaging, you know, yeah. it ebbs and flows. But the fact that I have this goal mm. to say, I need to have as many high impact relationships when the book comes out, and, and they can't just, be, it's not enough just to have them on the show. No. I got to have them on a great show and build goodwill and have them yeah. go, man, you know, I'm on, because we're talking about folks like yourself. This isn't your first show and it needs to be a good enough experience that if I call you a year from now, mm. hey, it's Jeff. You're like, oh yeah, I, I remember we had a great time. Not just like, oh yeah, that was another show. I don't even remember, right? Yeah. So it's, it forces me to elevate my standard and my consistency because I, because I have a goal because it's part of a plan. And yeah. um, it's been, it's, it's one of the, you know, in the ancillary benefit is this is one of the fastest growing entrepreneurial podcasts, you know, on the internet, yeah. but that was never even the goal. <laughs> that's, so, that's exciting. And of course, what you've also said something else, you may not be aware that you've said it, but one of the things that defines success is, is people who are successful do not wait to be motivated. They take action. We have this misunderstanding. I'm going to sit here. And when motivation turns up, oh, here it is knocking on my door. I'm going to do it. That's completely reversed. Motivation begins when you take action, when you don't want to go to the gym and you go anyway, and you think I just do half a circuit, then you are motivated to complete when you don't want to and think, you know what, I just open my computer and do some spell check and some look at the fonts and just play with it a bit. <laughs> now you're motivated. I've often sat and I thought I just write for half an hour, three and a half hours later, I'm still there. Because motivation follows action. You can't wait for the motivation to take action. You have to take the action to be motivated and like all people who said I didn't like writing but now I like it I didn't like running and all of a sudden I love running I hated going to the gym and now I'm an addict I took sugar out of my coffee it was disgusting and now I can't even imagine drinking it any other way you have to take action in order to be motivated and if you wait for motivation to take action you'll be waiting a long long time that's yeah that's that's so well said I, I heard a quote 
maybe it was a couple of weeks ago. I saw it somewhere. It was like in a YouTube video or something. And Elon Musk, somebody asked him at, at one of his, you know, presentations or something he was doing, a conference. They said, you know, how do you, um, how do you motivate people to, to take action or in your organization, you said, high energy, high productivity organizations, how do you keep people motivated? He said, I don't hire people that need to be motivated. If people need to be motivated, they just shouldn't do it. And there were all these comments in the thread that you could tell people misunderstood him. They were like, well, mm -hmm. that's not fair. Nobody feels motivated all the time. Everybody needs to be motivated because nobody's going to always feel motivated. And that was just comment after comment after comment. And I went back and listened to him again. And I was like, I don't, I don't think he was saying that he only hires people that are motivated all the time because there's no such thing. He was saying he hires people who will do the work regardless of whether or not they're motivated yeah. because they're, they believe in the goal. Exactly, exactly. And it's, you know, I tell something as I tell people all the time is that people are successful lead clues. Certainly Elon Musk is definitely one of them. So people get very confused with this understanding that to be successful, you must be willing and prepared to do what you do not want to do to get to where you want to be. And all people are successful will do what they don't want to do to get to them. People who fail will give up their dream faster than do what they don't want to do. You know, mm -hmm. I worked with somebody he was very famous and very heavy. And he says, you know, I can't go to the gym because people laugh at me and I hate working out. I said, look, you need to lose half your body weight. And what you have to do is wake up and go, I hate working out. I'm doing it now. I'm doing what I don't want to do first. I don't want to do it. So I'm doing it first. And of course, like everyone, he didn't like getting up at 5 a.m., putting on his training shoes and taking his very obese frame around his neighborhood in the dark. But of course, as he continued to do it and remind himself, if I don't want to do it, then I do it now because that's the mark of success. If there's a success club that I could join and the membership dues would do what you don't want to do first, well, I better pay those dues. But of course, lo and behold, and did he lose half his body weight? He continued to, to work out because I actually love it now. I hated it. Now I love it. And so successful people do what they do not want to do, and they do it first. They take action almost every day in the direction of their goals on their way to success. When they've made it, they can take a lot of time off. They just don't take no for an answer. They delay gratification. They reward themselves. They praise themselves. They, they use really good language of, I did great, I did well, today I was amazing. And you can say, well, none of those things are natural to me. Well, you know, peeing in a toilet wasn't natural once. That doesn't mean none of us got used to it. You make a decision, it's not natural, I'll make it natural. Weightlifting, running, skipping rope, these things aren't really natural, but if you do them all the time, and again, the lens in your eye, floss in your teeth, they're not natural. Mm -hmm but you can make them natural. So you have to decide if there are some particular habits that I could adopt and make them my own and I'd be successful. What's stopping me? Nothing. Only your own thoughts. There's nothing stopping except your thoughts. If you go, right, I'm going to like it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell myself I love it. Then it will become real. I mean, someone said to me, you know, I read your book and I run up a hill and every time I think I hate the last bit going uphill and I've started to go, I love the last bit. It's my favorite bit. I like it. This is a now. I really love the last bit. And I run up that hill faster because I realized that I was putting my own brakes. We're going, I hate this last bit. This last bit is torture. And I said, this last bit is the best bit of all because you can choose every day how to speak to yourself. You're free to speak to yourself however you like, but the choice you can't make is what you do to yourself when you say negative things. I hate it, it's not working, it's torture. I can't do it, I'm not good enough. So you can choose how to speak to yourself, but you cannot choose the damage you do to your potential when you go into negativity. Because if you could look inside your body and see that damage, you'd never think a negative thought in your life. It's like smoking. If you could, if you could actually had a camera in your lungs, yeah probably never smoke. That's really interesting that you can choose what you say to yourself, but you cannot choose what you've done to yourself when you yeah. say the wrong thing to yourself. You can choose I, what you say to yourself, but you can't choose the effects. If you say positive things, you can't choose to have a negative effect. And if you choose to say negative things, you cannot choose to have positive effects. I'll, uh, I'll share with you another, um, 
little little hack I came up with because you know I when I started Entra, I started my education company. I, I wanted I really wanted to lead by example and and do you know be the best student in the program basically. And you know you talk about getting up at five a.m. even getting up at four a.m. Right? It's a thing. People do it. People complain about it. It's hard. So I decided I'm not going to get up at five a.m. because I will probably not go through life not hearing people talk about how hard it is to get up at 5 a.m. Like I'm going to hear it, right? And it's going to force me to think it's hard too. So I said, I'm going to get up at 3.30 because nobody else does that. Yeah. Which means I never have to hear anybody talk about how hard it is. Yeah, that's so clever. So it's all, at this point, it, my, my entire feeling around that is the aggregation of one person's talk, not many. Yeah. And um, that's, that's, you know, and I've learned to love it. I really have. I, mm -hmm. I get, I get annoyed when, when I'm traveling and something, I, I can't do it for whatever reason. So Marissa, this is, this has been amazing. I'm like, I'm looking at the time going, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to be on, I'm literally supposed to be on a training right now. And I'm, I'm torn. This is incredible. I, you're incredible. I was already a fan. Um, I'm grateful to hopefully say now I'm a friend, like, thank you so, so much for coming on Millionaire Secrets and dropping this amazingness. I actually took some notes and I'm going to share them with our team so that they get shared in the show notes. Um, cause this has just been so good. And I, I feel like I just got a free counseling session. This is you do. And, and also, you know, you mentioned earlier that some of your clients, of course, um, are financially restricted. If you go to marissapeer.com, we have a ton of stuff and we give it away and we love to give it away. We have audios on health blocks, wealth blocks, success blocks, money wiring, and they're all free. We don't ask for a credit card. Take as many as you like, give them to other people. But if you want some free um, audios, it's a bit like, you know, your mind is a bit like software. If your computer gets a bug, it slows down and then someone mm -hmm. comes along and upgrades it. Well, our audios upgrade your thinking, get rid of the bugs so you work better. And right. Is it your voice? Free. Is it your voice on the audio? My voice, they're my audios. Because I've, been, I've been incredibly soothed for the last hour <laughs> by your beautiful voice. So I'm oh, hoping it is. You. It's definitely my voice and they're all totally free. No strings at marissapeer.com. And so, and I, that was going to be my last question is um, that thank you for that. Where can people, where else can people go to get deeper into your world? Are you on social media? Do you put out content? Do you, yeah, do you I'm have on, courses on, that you don't give away for free? Like what else yeah. have you got? So I'm on Instagram and I'm on YouTube and I'm so glad I'm called Marissa Peer because there's only me, which is good. So you can find me on Instagram and you can find me on YouTube. MarissaPeer.com is for all our free products. If you want to train with me and do exactly what I do, go to RTT.com. You want to find someone doing what I do in your area, one of the 7,000 people we've trained, go to rtt.com. And if you want to join the I'm Enough movement, then just go to imenough.com. And again, we have a lot of free stuff that we give away there. I uh, thank you. I appreciate that. We'll, we'll capture all those links. We'll put them in the descriptions. I just want to mention that you, you talked about your name, Marissa Peer. I find it ironic because you are, is your middle name without Marissa, without Peer? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, I just did an interview with someone that said, you know, in India, a peer is a holy person that helps people. I thought, oh, that's really cool. Someone else said, you know, your word is an anagram for I am a seer. So I love that too. So oh, it's wow. cool that we, we get these names and then we live up to them. Hey, thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Millionaire Secrets Show. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely going to love this one. Check it out. 